On this week's episode of I Believe Now What, we are kicking off a brand new series, and that is going to be on eschatology, or otherwise known as the study of the last things or the end of times. And I am really excited for this because instead of just sitting here listening to me talk about it nonstop, I am bringing in different people from different viewpoints. And we're going to be doing this over this series over the next few weeks and just really deep diving into these different views and talking about it. So I'm really excited. Today is going to be the introduction episode. I brought in my my buddy Tyler, who's over at Brewed Up Apologetics. He will be helping me as we just kind of do a rough overview and unpack eschatology as a whole. This is the first episode, so sit back, uh, relax, and hopefully you are excited for this because I know I definitely am. Hello, everybody. My name's Tim Perko, and you're listening to I Believe. Now what? Hey, what's going on? And as you heard from the introduction, we are kicking off our series on eschatology. And this is something that's going to be going on for the next few weeks. And I am really excited about it. I've got most of the interviews conducted and done. We are bringing in different people from different beliefs. So that way you can hear it from the horse's mouth on why they believe what they believe, just so you can get these overviews on these different points of the end times. And the main reason why I'm doing this is number one, to show that you can be a brother and sister in Christ, but have different views on eschatology. It should not be a separating issue. And number two, I'm doing this because oftentimes, and I know it's the case for me and many other Christians that I met, where they were only told one way to view the end times. And not until later on in life did I find out that there were other views and other views that actually hold merit, as you'll see when we go through here. So essentially what the layout is gonna be is this episode, is going to be dedicated to a broad overview. I'm bringing in my buddy Tyler from Brewed Up Apologetics. We're going to give a nice broad overview of eschatology as a whole. It's going to be a two-part for this, so this week and next week. And then afterwards, we're jumping into post-millennialism. And don't worry if you don't know what these words are. That's exactly what this is for. We are going to define these terms for you. Then after that, we're bringing in another friend of mine, and we're going to go over premillennialism, and then last but not least, amillennialism, and really all the subgenres and groups that come with that in between. So I am really excited for this. I think this is going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully you are edified and educated out of this. And as always, if you have any questions, write write us at uh, ibnw podcast at gmail.com that's for the email and if you want you can find us on social media we're on facebook instagram twitter or you can find me my personal account on tiktok at saved by the savior all one word well without any more delay let's go ahead and get into this part one of an overview on eschatology So hey everybody, welcome back and really excited over the past few weeks. I know we didn't upload last week, but the reason why was because we are going to be focusing in on eschatology, which is a subject that sometimes gets talked about too much and other times doesn't get talked about enough. But we're not going to just focus in on one side of eschatology. We are going to be focusing in on eschatology as a whole and specifically focusing on the millennium since most major views are brought up on the millennium and what that means. Maybe you don't even know what the word millennium means. You've never even come across this. So that's what this entire series that we're going to be doing over the next few episodes is going to be focused on, is defining this. And what our goal is, is to give you a very non-biased view of these different areas in eschatology. Because honestly, for the most part, unless you get really crazy in the left or right field, none of these views should ever be a dividing thing for you. You shouldn't separate your fellowship with other Christians based upon your eschatological views. And that's a tongue-twisting word right there. Now, uh, before we actually start really getting into this, I actually brought one of my buddies onto the show. I want to introduce Tyler. Tyler, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, thanks, Tim. Uh, Yeah, so like you said, my name is Tyler. And if you follow Tim on, on TikTok, you, you've probably seen me comment on some of his stuff. Uh, I go by Brewed Up Apologetics on there. Um, I'm actually with uh, Ratio Christi. So there is a uh, – it's a campus ministry that's geared towards bringing apologetics to the college campus. That's and outstanding. That, it's, dude, it is so much fun, and I absolutely love it. Um, but that becomes like our evangelistic tool. So then we're not really presenting the gospel with the Bible. We're presenting the gospel through evidences – that lead to the gospel um, and lead to the biblical narrative. 
So that's kind of our that's kind of what I do for my day job. Um, so I spend a lot of time on campus, and then I also, you know, I do the whole podcasting thing every so often. It's you know, what's the name really of your we podcast? Talking. The it's same thing, brewed up apologetics. Um, I tried to keep it really simple, so then I wouldn't have to remember like six different things. <laughs> oh yeah, that's it's perfect. Well, yeah, so that's that's typically what I do. Um, yeah, uh, so it was oddly enough, like my my hobby ended up becoming my job. So it's kind of hard to like separate the two now. Oh, that's um, perfect. I mean, that that's one of the goals right there. If you can make, uh, especially if you're, I mean, you, you need to be called into it. But if you can make, you know, ministry a full time deal, I think that's that's really awesome and amazing. And especially when you're called to it, and I truly believe God will. Uh, you know, if that's your calling, God will provide a way through it. Might not always be easy. If, yeah. But that yeah, that no, God's going to provide 100%. that way. So once again, I want to thank yeah. you for coming on. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm actually really excited about this. Uh, I already recorded one of the shows, which is going to be coming out the week prior. Probably going to split that up into a few episodes where we talked about post-millennialism. Once again, we're going to get into all these definitions as we go along. I just want to give you the fair warning it is almost unavoidable that there's certain words that we're going to use here, and if you're not familiar with, you might need to pause and uh, uh, you know look these up. There's no shame in that. I often still do it today. I'll I'll listen to some theologians or people on the radio, and I'll have to take a pause, Google a word that they heard, you know, and look it up. But we're going to do our best today to really one define eschatology, two kind of talk about these words that you may hear get thrown around, so that way we can pretty much put a definition to them so that way it's not complete foreign language to anybody. And then just overall talk about, number one, the importance of eschatology, and two, how this isn't really a dividing factor as we talked about earlier. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the, the big question, what is eschatology? Just a brief summary of that, you know, eschatology, anytime you see the word ology on something, that's the study of uh, so eschatology is going to be the study of the last things or often referred to as the end of times. Do you have anything you wanted to add on that? No, I think that was that's that's really good. Um, just looking at my notes here, that's quite literally almost exactly what I wrote. So no, oh, that's perfect. Great minds think alike, I guess. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I do want to point out eschatology is not, as I said before, it should never be a dividing factor. Um, mm -hmm, it, it's not something like, you know, Christology or soteriology, which are the study of God uh, and the study of salvation. It, it, it's not as central as that. You know, people can have differences in eschatology, and it is perfectly fine as long as it doesn't deny those other two, the, you know, who Christ is and how salvation works. If it doesn't deny that, then you are completely fine. There might be a little gray areas here and there, but for the most part, no. Uh, so a lot of stuff that maybe you've heard before that, that, that deals with eschatology is the word rapture. Do you have anything you want to talk about mm -hmm. on the rapture? It's not really like something that I would want to really talk about, just because it does. it has come under fire in the past like 10 to 20 years just because of that left behind series oh yeah um so when when i think when i think of the rapture i immediately think of that kurt cameron like movie that they did <laughs> that they did with it and then immediately then after that i go to that nick cage one that was even worse than the kurt cameron one. Oh yeah um, no i've watched both sadly <laughs> um just out of sheer curiosity I, yeah. my, my introduction to eschatology was actually left behind as a young kid watching those Kirk oh, yeah, Cameron yeah. films. And that's another reason why I really wanted to do this is because I was so convinced that there was only one view out there for so long. And mm -hmm. when I actually started taking the Bible seriously and then learning from other people, and I saw that there are other views out there. Uh, and, and that's what I really wanted to get across out here, that there are other views. And each one has their merits. Each one has their, has their downfalls. I mean, this is, we're talking about some pretty, pretty big stuff here. And like you said, the rapture has been uh, under fire, especially amongst uh, people who, whose entire ministry is focused on the rapture. I think that's one of those things where every generation mm -hmm. thinks they're the ones who are going to experience <laughs> the rapture at some point in time. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think that there's some, there's something to that with that urgency that, you know, that, is all around the church just the whole concept of like you know you don't know when the when the rapture is going to happen and I'm, I'm not i don't even know if i would use the word rapture 
Well, yeah, because be it's honest, not a I word that's, that's actually found in the Bible, but yeah, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, same thing. Same thing. Like the Trinity. The Trinity is not found in the Bible, but mm-hmm. the concept is. But I just don't think. I think it might be time to re return it, um, and just return it to like the snatching away or future restoration. Yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah, pretty much yeah. what Paul talks about in Thessalonians. You know, it's the snatching away. It's uh, being caught up in the air with the Lord, uh, mm-hmm. and and. and uh, I think Second people get flood. so focused around that one word yeah. rapture and then yet like you said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean even if we want to like ascribe it to Christ, like having like it's the hu- it's like the the full human ascension or something like that or the humanity's ascension. Mhm. Um if we want to kind of attribute it to something that happened to Christ cuz I mean the resurrection is one of my favorite topics. Oh yeah. And like if we are to be like Christ and being conformed to Christ's image. Romans then 8, yeah. If we look yeah, if we look at the at what happened to Jesus after he rose, he w- he ascended into heaven. It's like, oh, maybe you know, maybe this could be a little bit of a fringe take on it. Maybe that's what it, what's going to happen to us. It's not that we're going to be resurrected and then ascended, but those that are raptured are more or less ascended into heaven. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I could see how that could be a little bit of a fringe take, but at the same time, it's not a uh, completely incorrect view, because going back to the whole Left Behind stuff, like you said, people will take the, these images that they've had in their head of the rapture, you know, clothes being left on the ground, and just, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 and these images get pushed into people's heads. This is why I get so careful when, uh, I don't know how you feel about this, like, but when people are recommending, oh, you know, go watch The Chosen, go watch The Passion of the Christ or something like that. And I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with these because, one, I really just don't watch it. Uh, but I don't watch it for the pure reason because I don't want to put extra biblical images of things that may or may not have happened, but it's not recorded in the Bible in my head. I, I remember mm-hmm. as a little kid watching The Prince of Egypt and thinking that was entirely biblical and everything was super accurate, and only to find out when I was older that most of that stuff that they put in there was, you know, for just for drama purposes only. And, mm-hmm. it, you know, and that's why I get very careful when it comes to Christian fiction literature um, or even Christian nonfiction. I'm using little quotes there with my hands, like mm-hmm. The Chosen, you know, where you're taking events that happened and then adding to it saying, well, this could have happened. But then, you know, like one of the examples with The Chosen, uh, one of the reasons why I didn't want to watch it is they they portray, from what I've read, uh, Matthew as a um, autistic person Mm -hmm. because they assume he's a tax collector, he's good with numbers, and somehow that equals Rain Man. (laughs) But, I, you know, and that's one of the... movies, so why not? Yeah, you know. (laughs) So that's one of those images where I feel like somebody who's not familiar with their Bible or who's new to Christianity, and they see that, they're going to presuppose in their head that Matthew was an autistic guy. So when they read his gospel, they're picturing, you know, this autistic person writing the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, And like I said, that's just one of those images. I want to keep the images that I have of the Bible and what the Bible says, you know, pretty much around there, exactly what the Bible says. And I don't want to let these outside sources, as images pun- punch in. And sadly, those yeah. Left Behind series, uh, views on the rapture, all these different YouTube videos you can go watch, that that's exactly what they do. They plant these images inside your head. Mm-hmm. Uh, so moving on from the rapture, yeah. uh, you know, why is the second coming important? And why is it important for Christians to understand the second coming? I'll let you take that one. I honestly just want to like instinctively say just kind of flowing right from what you were just saying about keeping our, our views about the Bible kind of in a closed system surround and with the Bible as that closed system. Um, and it's like Jesus mentioned it, like it's going to happen. I, you just don't know when. Yeah, they, so, the Bible's clear that there's gonna there, there's two times Christ comes, and it, it, one is going to be when he already came, that's already fulfilled the first time, mm-hmm. uh, born of a virgin, human flesh, fully God still, and he is going to return back, and we know that. And some people will often criticize, I actually just watched a video the other day of Brian Simmons, who is the author of the Passion Translation, <laughs> and most of you on this podcast already know how I feel about that, you know, denying the second coming. He's like, the second coming's not even in the Bible. He's already here. Like, oh boy, here we go. And that actually kind of gets into a topic. Next thing you know, it's going to be Brian. 
like he's the second coming of Christ. Or I mean that like that. that's how we we can have a whole nother discussion on that. But that's how cults start. I I I told oh, people yeah. when the Passion came out, there were some people in a charismatic church that that I was friends with that were heavily relying on that book. And I'm like, this is how cults start. When you say you have a private revelation of Jesus appearing to you and saying, "Oh, the Bible's yeah. wrong. I need you to rewrite it." Yeah, <laughs> that's how cults start. Uh, and sadly, yeah. there are churches that propagate that. But hey, good fight for the win. You know, Bible Gateway removed it from their from their yeah. uh, website, which if you haven't heard of Bible Gateway, it's a great website if you just want to compare and contrast various different versions of Scripture. I use it all the time uh, because it's right yeah. there on your computer, and you can have them side by side, and it's free. Uh, so uh, glad Bible Gateway removed the Passion Translation from its. Uh... Yeah, so did uh, so did U Version. So that's that's also. Oh, U Version did as well. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's they, a surprising uh... step for them because I know that's ran by um, what's that huge church in Oklahoma? I can't remember the name, but I, I know it's ran by that really big church in Oklahoma. Uh, but that's really good that they did. That's awesome, and and credit yeah, to them for doing I... that. Yeah, and it's kind of cool too, especially with U Version when it comes to especially things like the like eschatology like you're going to have different translations whenever they have their their views of the bible and especially things like eschatology whenever they do their translation of revelation they're going to put their or at least have that influence come out so you know when it comes to revelation eschatology and your different translations having that ability to compare and contrast your different your different bible translations could potentially really help weed out where you really lie on it mm -hmm. um and even like what what uh translation that you use whenever you do want to read revelation because revelation is super super crazy i don't even want to come close to saying like i understand it like there's so much in there that is just waiting to be unpacked and I don't even know if John himself understood it. He was just kind of there. Yeah, I mean, reporting well, what he what he saw. Exactly. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's one of the first things in, in Revelation chapter one, you know, that is told to John: write down what you see. Mm -hmm. So, and it does beg the question of maybe John is not simply understanding what we see, and that's that's going to get into a topic we're going to kind of talk about yeah. here soon. Uh, but the next thing I wanted to go in was actually Revelation, so it's a perfect segue. Uh, one of the common, you know, beliefs is that revelation is going to be, you know, anything eschatology wise, all revelation. Uh, and while that is true, revelation is super big in eschatology, uh, the study of the end times. There are other books in the Bible and other passages inside the Bible mm -hmm. that do talk about it, whether it would be, you know, you know, Daniel in the Old Testament, you got parts of Ezekiel, uh, you, you've you got Jesus's uh, discourse in Matthew, there's Luke, there's lots of other places in the Bible that do talk about the end times. And mm -hmm. depending on how you view what our next topic we're going to talk about is, uh, is really going to change on how you read those passages. And what we're talking about is how do you view the millennium? Now, if you don't know what the millennium is, it, it is a millennium literally is a thousand years uh, in its most literal term. It's, an, it's a thousand year time frame. And you see this in the book of Revelation, specifically in chapter 20. And many different beliefs revolve around the millennium. And when I say that, I'm, I'm saying there are people that will say the millennium is a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ. Other people will say it is a figurative reign in Christ here on earth. Other people say it's a figurative reign of Christ while he's in heaven, so currently right now. And all those types of views will change how you read those different passages in Matthew and in Daniel uh, on whether or not this stuff past as it, it happened in the past or is it future did it happen in the future it's it's gonna change a lot so that leads to our next question you know how do we understand the millennium is it figurative or literal and spoiler alert i'm not personally going to tell you uh you know what to do with that i mean i have my views on it but as i was talking about earlier with tyler like we're, my views i hold very loosely uh, i'm kind of stealing a mike wiener line for that one but it's true <laughs> i i hold my eschatology views very loosely. I don't have a death iron grip on them. I am willing to change my mind when presented with evidences that, that do end up changing my mind. Uh, it's not something that I'm 
holding to very strongly. What, what would you say when it comes to that? Yeah, no, I am very much of the same stripe. Um, I do have my own views, um, but again, it's not something that I want to divide over. Um, so if, if let's just say, or you know what, like I'm, I'm more of like a premillennial mm-hmm. in my in how I view things, but just because I'm a premill doesn't mean that the post or the amill doesn't have a really good case for what they're doing. They they all have really good cases, and, and it's, as we we're gonna get to with the amill, like it is just it's so broad that you know it's like okay, <laughs> you know what, you you have a case, I'm gonna hold it with an open hand. Let's see what happens. And this is like an, it's an in-house discussion. So this is more like for fun. Mm-hmm. Like these discussions are something that you would like around the campfire with your buddies on a, on a Saturday night. Like this is just something that you would just have fun with your buddies talking about. And then because it's your buddies, you can get really mad at them. That is but... the perfect <laughs> description, I think, when it comes to talking about these views. You know, because all my conversations that I've had with most people, like in church, you know, it would be. After Wednesday night, which most people know, you know, Wednesday night is usually when the more, depending on when your church does, you know, not your typical Sunday crowd. It's usually your more serious crowd. And, you know, we would spend, I remember, hours in the parking lot after church, pastor kicking us out, like, come on, guys, let's go, you know, Mm -hmm. all the way up until midnight, just talking about whether it be eschatology or these other secondary views that that don't have anything to do with uh, salvation, uh, and and yeah. just going over all these different concepts. I even had a guy in my church, huge pre-mill guy, which don't worry, we're going to define these terms in a second. He, <laughs> This guy, he was so focused on it. He actually had this huge Microsoft Excel timeline that had all these hyperlinks to videos. And I'll have to put that out one day. Yeah, but he that's just the way his brain works. He was an architect. Uh, so okay. he was, yeah, his, his brain had to work in like that linear timeline with all these different charts mm-hmm. and stuff. It was just funny. But like you said, you said it perfectly. This is something where you and your buddies can sit back and just kind of fellowship, iron sharpens iron over. And not get angry with each other if you hold different Mm -hmm. viewpoints uh it's definitely not something to get angry about so yeah with that being said let's let's jump into actually what are the different views on the millennium and you've heard us use some of them but we have pre-millennial which i i would probably assume is the most popular today i think it's fading a little bit but it's it's most popular today mainly because of the left behind series like we talked about um (laughs) yeah i actually hold to more futurist uh timeline which is the same as you know pre-mill essentially uh then you have post-mill which means oh so let's back this up actually a little bit more pre-mill basic understanding christ returns before the millennium uh that that's essentially what pre-mill means christ returns before the millennium and then you have your post-mill which is christ returning after the millennium and then on mill which is kind of a deceiving name for it because they do believe in a millennium, but Amil, you know, in its most basic terms means, oh, there, there is no actual millennium. But, you know, if you ask an Amil person that, they'll say, no, there is a millennium and they'll say we're in it right now. So that's, that's, that's the most basic way of defining. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start off with, with pre-mill. And obviously, since you're more futurist and pre-mill, and so am I, this will probably be the easiest one for us. But yeah. go ahead, let's let's talk about pre-mill a little bit. What what are your some some of your comments on it, on helping people understand what it is? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, it just kind of seems like that's just kind of at, at the plain reading, like that just kind of seems like where where the Bible wants to go. It, I, from I my like how you said plain reading because that that's that's important for. Uh, Mm -hmm. how people view revelation continue on yeah so you know just a few like a precursor comment to plain reading um just knowing and being an apologist like this is my like definitely a vice for me um is that yes the plain reading of scripture is absolutely what we need to be like kind of like our starting point (laughs) um but you know like when it if you have the ability to go deeper with the resources and things like that, it's almost as if we are obligated to do so. So yeah, take your plain reading of scripture. Like, you know, this, I, I see a lot of this, especially with 
the millennium and things like that, it does relate back to Genesis 1. Um, we can get to that in a second. But how it's like, yeah, there's that plain reading of Genesis 1 where if you're going to come to a very specific conclusion on that. Yeah, six there's days. Nothing, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, six, six days, 24-hour days. There's nothing wrong with that. I hold a different view, but the reason I hold a different view is because I have I do have a little bit more of a sway towards science, um, and I, I love that stuff. But and mind you, this is another secondary issue you shouldn't let separate. It, it, yes. By the way, yeah, yeah, no, one hundred percent, it is a secondary issue. Um, but I know some people get very to, heated you know, over the six literal days or the old Earth, new Earth type type menta- mm-hmm. mentality yeah. but yes uh, yeah. so i didn't mean to distract yeah. you from that no you're good you're good it's a very very heated um and there's some of the most fun conversations to watch um <laughs> yes but it's like you know at, so so something like genesis one like it, by all means if you just want to leave it there at genesis one six days 24 hours whatever you however you come to that conclusion just re- be reminded that it is a secondary maybe even tertiary issue oh yeah and that you don't need to go any deeper. But things like the resurrection, which is a, a very, very primary issue, if not the central issue of Christianity, because mm-hmm. without it, we wouldn't have it. Uh, Paul even said would, that, you know, if if, the, yeah. if, there, if Christ wasn't resurrected, then we all believe in vain. Yeah, yeah. So things like that, the, those primary, like, central things, like, yes, go, go as deep as you can on them. And I think that we have an obligation to do that and a scriptural mandate to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and because when we do that, we get to know God better and then we can become more like Christ as we do that. So when it comes to things like pre-mill, post-mill, all mill, that's, I see pre-mill as just kind of being that plain reading of scripture. And because this is a tertiary issue, I'm not going to go any, a whole lot deeper than my own curiosity's sake. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so like, I mean, just the pre-mill, I mean, Jesus comes back before, and his, like the second coming happens before he reigns on earth. Um, and how we look at it from a pre-trib versus post-trib type of type of Oh way. yeah, because there, there are way. multiple different views. It, it kind of view it like this, people. Like if there, there, there are like, say, your three main views of the millennium. And then inside of those three main views are multiple different views. It's almost like denominations. Like somebody calls himself a mm-hmm. Protestant, and you're like, okay, well, what's a Protestant? And then you oh, you got Baptist, and you got Methodist, and you got yeah. Charismatic yeah. and Pentecostal. You know, all these different uh, yeah. sub views, and, and that's exactly what it is with uh, eschatology when it comes to the millennium. You, you have pre mill, mm-hmm. and then what? Like you said, a lot of people will have debate inside the pre mill camp of when is the rapture. Uh, some will say mm-hmm. before the tribulation. If you don't know what the tribulation is, that's a seven year. Now, and this also is debatable depending on where <laughs> you stand. But in a pre mill, typically most people believe that the tribulation is a seven year period. They pull that out of the book of Daniel, where mm. uh, it's pretty much pretty, it's going to be pretty bad. It's going to be very bad, uh, and people will be persecuted for their beliefs. Mm-hmm. Now, some pre-mills will say that the rapture happens before that, Christ takes his church away so they don't have to experience that. And other people will say that it comes after the tribulation uh, because of certain verses uh, that, that kind of point in that direction. And then you have other people that will say the rapture happens in the middle, that there's going to be like a mm-hmm. three and a half year period, and that's when the rapture is going to happen. So you can see there's multiple different views when it comes to the pre-mill side, especially focused on the rapture. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's very um, important to understand, especially when it comes to the pre-mill side, that, and this is something that Mike Winger, who you mentioned earlier, pointed out um, that Israel, because of the nature of apocalyptic literature, it is very figurative. It's kind of poetic. Um, it has some. Israel is not the actual church, so it's not talking about the whole nation of Israel. Israel is more or less the camp of of Christians. Mm-hmm. That is just they consider themselves that, or that's God considers them the church. So then he's going to do that with and, and do everything that would normally happen to Israel with the church. Oh, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's another premillennial kind of tenet is how do you view the nation of Israel? Now, this varies from person to person. Like, so you have on one side, like the hyper dispensationalist camp 
uh, or even you could just say a regular dispensationalist. I, I consider myself, I'm going to steal words from John MacArthur here, like kind of like a leaky dispensationalist. I, I do see dispensations <laughs> in the Bible. Uh, and essentially what a dispensation is, I've explained it on here before, but if you're new, it, it's just essentially of how God works in various periods of time throughout the Bible. He's still the same. The plan for salvation is still the same. Uh, that never changes. But how God operates, say, the way he treated the nation of Israel may be a little bit different compared to how he treats the church today. Um, and mainly most people who consider themselves dispensationists can't agree on at least the one uh, Christ being that kind of line. Now, I'm not going to get too deep in, into it, but, you know, uh, from from the dispensationalist view, these pe these people are primarily more so in the pre-tribulational rapture camp. Uh, I mentioned John MacArthur earlier. He, he's one of those people who uh, are, are on that side, and that's one of the times that I'll actually disagree with him. Like I said, I'm more of a <laughs> post-tribulation rapture kind of person. But you, you, yeah. you specifically when you mentioned that, I just wanted to go ahead and highlight that. You also said another word I want to highlight for people, apocalyptic literature. Mm -hmm. uh, just a simple definition of it. It's a specific form of prophecy, largely involving symbols, imagery, uh, and predicting disaster and destruction, normally. Uh, so it, it's frequently used, it uses strange descriptions, bizarre imagery, uh, and you see this a lot in Revelation. You see it in Ezekiel. You'll see it in various parts of Daniel. Um, so that's what we mean by apocalyptic literature. It's literally these just giant images and symbols that might be hard to explain. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that. No, yeah, and I think I think that was a really good description. Um, and I think because, because uh, like this whole idea surrounding uh, what happens in eschatology and things like that is that when it comes to things that use imagery, we should hold it with an open hand mm -hmm. um, because there are multiple interpretations there because of it being imagery. It's a metaphor. It's supposed to be, for lack of a better term, uh, like open for interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where you get, yeah. uh, I just wanted to interject, this is where you get the, the, the pre-mill view of, you said once again, the plain reading of, of taking a primo often say, uh, and I'm going back to John MacArthur on this because he's the most primary primo guy I kind of know, and he'll straight up tell you the best way to read Revelation is to read it literally. And that's how most premills kind of view something such as Revelation or passages in Ezekiel or Daniel is they will read it and they will read it literally. So when, uh, you know, an, uh, an angel opens up the keys of Hades and flying out are scorpions with wings and uh, you know, locusts with scorpion tails, or uh, I can't remember the exact imagery. You know, that's mm -hmm. literally how a um, a pre mill would probably read that. Now, give or take some, I can't. I'm not going to define in a general audience because mm -hmm. let's let's face it. When you read Revelation, you can't. There's there's certain things in there that I believe you cannot take just at face value that there is a deeper meaning behind it. But most pre mill people mm -hmm. will read Revelation and and try to read it as literal as possible, which is where you get the entire view on the millennial kingdom of Christ coming before, because in the order that it has it in Revelation, from Revelation 19, where Christ returns on his white horse, to Revelation 20, where he defeats Satan and he sets up his millennial kingdom and binds him uh, in hell, or the um, and and then the releasing of him after the 1,000 years, you know, that that's why they believe the millennium the way they believe it because of the sequential ordering in the very direct language on the millennial kingdom, uh, the 1,000 year reign of Christ that they believe will happen on this earth for, for that period. Yeah, and I think it's very important, especially for your audience, to remember, like, regardless of whatever book of the Bible that you're reading, make sure that you do justice to the genre that it's in. Um, be and we're just well, I'll stay with with revelation because revelation is so heavy on the imagery and is a lot of times very poetic tr kind of treat it like that you know treat it as if it were a poem um there are real things that a, a poet is trying to get out and trying to encapsulate so the emotions that they're feeling the things that they're seeing are relatable to other people 
Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what we talked about it earlier, but John was told, write down what you see. Now, mm -hmm. how he interpreted what he saw, you know, that's really the crux of kind of where it is. And, and, you know, when he saw a locust with a scorpion tail or something like that, I know a primo person be like, oh, that sounds like an Apache helicopter. Uh, And they'll (laughs) think that John was trying to relate that image into. And other people will say, well, John knew uh, what it was, but he was trying, he was, like you kind of said, poetically describing what he was seeing, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in that apocalyptic writing. And we do have examples of that where this apocalyptic writing is being done uh, and, and it's using these poetic images that are actually representations of real things in that time. Uh, you, you take the, I believe it was the statue in one of the, the visions. I can't remember the book now, and I'm kind of having a hard time with it, but <laughs> describing you know the different uh, major empires of the world, the Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, and it goes up from the toes to the to the feet and so forth and so on up the statue. And, you know, that that was describing a real thing, but it was using imagery to do that. Uh, So you bring up a good point. Yeah, and I think, you know, to go back into that, you know, there's two different main camps within pre-mill. You have the dispensational and the progressive. Mm -hmm. Um, I lean more towards the progressive, um, even though I think dispensations is a really good, uh, like, adjective for how or what we see in the Bible, specifically, like, like the judges period. And things like that. Um, and even like whenever, after Jesus came, like that's a total, like after he ascended, like that's a totally different era that we live in compared to when he was here and resurrected. Um, but one of the things that the pre mill tends to do, and I think this is general for the entire camp in both on both sides is that we tend to, make current events really, really big things. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, and, I'm sorry, know. I'm just laughing because it's, if, if you don't understand what's, uh, when we're recording this right now, it's uh, February, or no, March the 3rd, uh, 2022. And right now uh, there's a huge event going on and, and Russia mm-hmm. is invading Ukraine. Uh, and, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not laughing at that because that's a very serious thing. And actually, I, me being in the military, I kind of take that kind of personal. Uh, but mm. it, it's this is something that you've already seen, especially on platforms like TikTok and YouTube, yeah. where people are pointing to this. This is a sign. This is a sign. You know, they're mm-hmm. constantly pointing to these real world events as signs. And by all means, they, they could be. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like there's, like you said, there's almost like an overemphasis on everything being a sign there. Yeah. And my immediate thought, cause I was talking to my dad about this and he's like, we were talking about, um, the end times. And like, I was telling you, um, just like on TikTok, whenever we were messaging back and forth, like, Hey, we're, I, we're like trying to buy a house and all this other stuff. And he's like, it's a really good time to do it. Cause you know, and end, end times are coming type stuff. And I'm like, okay, so this, okay. I know where you're at now. Um, for the record, but, my father is more on the very dispensational uh, mm-hmm. camp. You know, that's just how it, the seminary he he went to was uh, users of the the um, actually have it right here the uh, Schofield Bible and uh, which oh, is wow. a very heavy dispensationalist. You know, so he's yeah. definitely leaning more on that side of the camp. So we kind of I, I kind of empathize with you. I have those same conversations with my father. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know I I think it's a lot of generational stuff. Um, it just kind of seems like that's just the generation. But whenever he, he mentioned that, what I immediately thought was, we thought that about World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, all of the major, especially in America, all oh, of yeah. the major war, wars that we were involved in, everybody thought, even like the Cold War, where it was literally just like a, a shouting match, basically. Yeah. Um, when he's, it's like, you know, that's what we thought the end times were going to be. But I think that whenever it comes to things like current events, I think we should treat it like with an open hand. Mm-hmm. Um, that if you are going to view the current events that are happening as major things, it's like, yeah, they are major things. They directly affect you. But just because they directly affect you doesn't mean they directly affect the time, the the uh, the cosmological timeline. Mm-hmm. Uh, by and by cosmological timeline, I mean the entire the entirety of the history of the cosmos of the, or the universe. 
and that we are approaching the end of it. So I think that to do so is to kind of overstep the bounds of what's being said in, in, in scripture. Mm -hmm. Um, and if that's you know that's if you're holding it with such a tight grip, yeah, that it, you're not willing to be changed. And I guess I'll throw because I feel like we we have been kind of more beating up than supporting the pre mill side. I will I will throw this out <laughs> there. You know, one of the big reasons why pre mills and I you know like I said I'm I'm pre mill, so I'm, it's almost no, like self here. abuse. <laughs> yeah, you know, but but uh, one of the reasons why most pre mills will will look at this stuff is because we we do see times where Christ says be ready. You know, look for these signs. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people take that a little bit more serious than others. Uh, and, and there are some times where these signs do seem like one of the major ones. And I know, like, I already did the interview with uh, uh, Blake, who's going to be talking about post mill, and he has an answer mm -hmm. for this. So I'll leave it for that. But, you know, like one of the things that I see maybe uh, as those signs of the times was like the reestablishing of the nation of Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. And and while you can make arguments against that, as Blake, you'll see when Blake does it, uh, on that episode, you know, I personally see that as one of those signs like, oh, wow, the Bible actually talks about this. You know, mm -hmm. this could be yep. a legit thing. Uh, but for me personally, on the pre mill side, I stay away from a lot of the speculation of could this be, but rather, OK, this already happened. This is an obvious, you know, let the past mm -hmm. speak for itself, because in retrospect, that's where we kind of gain that insight as opposed to, you know, Russia invading Ukraine. Is this a sign of, you know, X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to yeah. speculate because it's not done and over with yet. Mm -hmm. That oh my, that is like a perfect segue into the already but not yet. Oh, like, yes, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. Like that. Beautiful. Um, so go but, ahead and explain already but not yet uh, since, yeah. since since you brought it up, because that that is a, a kind of a, a important view, especially depending on, I guess, which side of the camera. Well, mm -hmm. just go on and explain and we'll get into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. To, to keep the majors the majors, I'm gonna fo I want to focus the concept of the already but not yet on the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So, the concept of the already but not yet is that something already happened. It was fulfilled, but it is like a like almost like a two step fulfillment. Um, and correct me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the two step fulfillment is like in terms of like the resurrection that we are living in a post-resurrection time frame. But that post-resurrection is not our post-resurrection. It's Christ's post-resurrection. So that already happened. Mm -hmm. But it has not yet happened to us. So like how it, um, Christ was the first fruit to the resurrection that Paul talks about. The resurrection already happened. But he was the first fruits of the resurrection, and we are just we are waiting for the rest of the tree to get ripe. It's essentially, I mean, if I could break it down in the most simple words, it's the fact that Christ is currently reigning because uh, he's in he's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. I don't. Some people might try to debate that. I personally don't see how you can because the Bible's pretty clear that he is. Mm -hmm. There's my dog barking again. Uh, <laughs> but Christ is already reigning, but we haven't reached that full fulfillment of that yet because of like you said we aren't resurrected um there's still something yet to come hence the already but not yet and mm -hmm. i'm uh, and the other thing with this is there's kind of just like everything there's kind of multiple different views you have a more like grounded view of it and then there's also a more charismatic view of it which kind of leads into the prosperity gospel types mm -hmm. uh that you would see yeah. and believing that because christ is reigning we have this authority and we can activate christ's authority to command what we want you Come see those, now. Ac activate your faith let's go yeah activating <laughs> your faith controlling the weather and yeah no that that's that's fine um it's i guess it's something that took me a while to understand so if you're if this is like two ivory tower for you it's okay um there are a whole lot of people out there that talk about this just do a quick google search or youtube search and I'm sure you'll find like a bunch of people that are more qualified than me to talk about this. Yeah, like the Bible Project, I think has something on it. Like I know that they've mentioned it. Um, just regarding the already but not yet, it it is something that I see in Scripture as a plain reading. Um, so, like all of the Christ 
that have come before Christ. So like in in the Old Testament, like David was seen as a Christ. Like a type of Christ figure, yeah. A type, yeah, like a type of Christ figure, but it wasn't the Christ. It wasn't the Messiah. Like there was like David was doing his thing. He fulfilled a lot of prophecy, but he didn't fully fil- fulfill it because that was Jesus' job. Mm-hmm. That was that was the already filled, fulfilled, but not fully fulfilled like Christ did. So the, all of the sacrifices and things like that, they were fulfilled, but Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. So there was that already but not yet type mm-hmm. of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, we could go really deep on that and... You know that's that's a probably a topic for another day. Uh, oh yeah, you know it, it's one of those things where I've I, I I only recently kind of discovered what that already but not yet concept is. If if you wanted to go into it more, and I was just looking up some resources right here. Uh, if you wanted, if you're cu- more curious about it, you can go to gotquestions.org. Uh, they they have a little mm-hmm. section on that. I've I've suggested that on here before. Very good uh, website when you have questions. I will warn you that when you're specifically looking for eschatology, they are very, they, and they admit it, they say it straight up, that they believe in pre-mill eschatology. So that's like the only one area where I kind of see that they show some bias. Uh, but for the most part, they really don't show a bias in anywhere else. They're pretty good at reading scripture and reading scripture plainly. <laughs> now I can't say that without yeah. thinking back to our previous conversation. But uh, so... Yeah. A couple other tenets of pre-mill. So we mentioned how pre-mill will, will read Scripture literally, uh, mm-hmm. that their view of the millennium is that Christ will come before the millennium and that it is a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. So if you're wondering where we're at in the Bible, we're specifically on Revelation 20. That's where a lot of this revolves around. And they will view where, where John says millennium, he will view, or he doesn't say millennium, he says a 1,000 years which is a millennium, uh, and they view that as a literal thousand years. Uh, There's some other things that we could probably, uh, anything else you wanted to add into pre-mill before we move on, but we'll probably get on to uh, post-mill here next. I think, you know, just regarding events in history, because, I mean, that's all, that's always going to pop up. Those, the events that happen in history, it's more of like a, like a resemblance mm-hmm. to what's going on in Revelation, rather than a, a literal like with that literal reading um so the whole idea about that sorry yeah so the events in history they they resemble things in revelation but i think that if we read it too literally we might miss some things mm-hmm. um so that's why that's i, I just want to leave that there and re re or come back to that open-handed holding of my, my view basically 100%. i'm okay with it being a literal like the 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 13 headed beast like i'm okay with that being literally a, a literal thing but if it's not literal i'm that's okay as well mm-hmm. yeah and then like i said it goes back to the kind of the there's pros and cons with each view and like we pointed out with yeah. with with pre-milled you know there 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 are some very compelling evidences for pre-mill eschatology. And there's also some pretty, um, you know, I don't want to say condemning, that's probably a bad word, but, you know, flaws with with some of those Mm -hmm. views. There's certain passages where you look like, well, can you explain this? And it's like, uh, let me do some biblical gymnastics here. And, you know, there's people are always going to attempt to explain it. Uh, Mm -hmm. But especially when you start relating to things in the Old Testament, which we're we're about to jump into here with post-millennialism. All right, guys, and this is going to be the end of part one of our overview on eschatology. I know we only did the intro and premillennialism. On the next episode, we're going to start our overview on postmillennialism and amillennialism. And then once again, like I said, after that, then we're going to get into the real deep dives of those three views. So hopefully you've enjoyed the episode so far. And if once again, questions, comments, concerns, by all means, write us ibnwpodcast at gmail.com or find us on social media. Stay tuned next week for part two of our overview of eschatology.